I thought this could be kind of interesting subject as I have been kind of trapped into to the weight system for, 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 for a long time when I made bows. Uh, trapped in a way that I have supposed that, that the dealers uh, want bows that are, let's say, about 59 to 62 grams for a violin bow. And, and, uh, and uh, this has been uh, kind of mind boggling for me. And uh, uh, so I thought it could be interesting to hear a little bit about your thinking and uh, if we could uh, somehow develop this uh, thinking and uh, making it a little bit more free. Okay, anyone wants to... to, to, to... T Tony, start recording. Oh yeah, I am recording. Okay, okay. sorry. Anyone has been uh, thinking about it uh, as well as I have done, so just asking. I mean, I have some thoughts, right, regarding, um, regarding that, right? Um, you know, I think that there's a reason why we've centered around these, these weights and balances due, due to what players have, have, have come to find that works really well for them across all repertoire. Um, I think that if you go too far one way or another, you have to compromise on some aspects, you know, uh, too light, you might have to compromise on tone or volume, you know, um, uh, too heavy, it might be, you know, hard, more clumsy to play. Um, but I think as music musicians, you're always having to compensate for something. So if a bow does something like extremely, extremely well, and you have to compensate a little bit for uh, whatever reason, you know, I think it's still a good bow. If a player can make it work, that's kind of my thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Can I, I, I can say something a bit from another angle, because I don't make um, what we call modern bows, I make historical bows. So actually with historical bows, there is no standard. Uh, we use um, old models for, uh, to base the bows, and the variations in length, uh, uh, weight, uh, also the way the stick is um, cambered, the whole physical functioning of the stick and even the material of the stick um, is not fixed. Um, so, uh, so it's a question how we want to think of a bow because um, I think the, the thinking of, of, uh, of the modern bow or of it was we make one bow to play everything uh, and the thinking of the um, uh, the historically informed uh, uh, way of making music is um, a, a bow that was made uh, at the time and also at the place of just say uh, Vivaldi uh, is made in a way to play Vivaldi's music and uh, if you take Brahms music, it's another, even the music, you can say it's another substance, it's another, uh, it's another material. So you would need to use another tool, uh, just like you can, uh, if you are painting, if you use oil, oil paints or uh, aquarelle, you need a different brush. You don't do it with the same brush. Uh, maybe it's a bit like what we talked about, the, the tooling uh yesterday but it's musical tools yeah, yeah um so there are players that of course when there is a standard and everybody expects something to be within a standard uh when a player sees something which is outside the norm is either says oh it's outside what i'm used to uh, well uh, i can't use it or he would say oh it's uh this is something new this is exciting yeah, yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, uh, I will just interrupt you a little bit there yeah. about the the, the 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 what the musician here. Oh, is it just fifty eight grams? Oh, that's not nothing for me. It's really easy to to, to build up a feeling that is not for me. Then, so I I don't tell the way nowadays. Just try yeah. it out. 
and other things will decide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because there is function, for instance, I've seen bows uh, much lighter uh, than uh, the, six, the norm of 60 gram that uh, catch the string very well and produce uh, a big sound. I've seen bows of um, 50 grams uh, do that, and I even I made twice a bow based on an old bow, uh, which is not made from Pernambuco, it's made from Larch. Okay. So it's a uh, Larix, it's a European uh, wood, um, and uh, it's maybe 40 grams. Um, and it catches the string very well and makes a, a bright sound. Yeah. Um, it's just a different feeling, you know, it's a different tool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So Anthony, Anthony, just wanted to ask you a little bit, will, will you moderate and then uh, turn out, uh, point out who is next in? Yeah, um, John wants, John has something to share. So I don't, uh, I don't uh, take this responsibility. <laughs> yeah, John has something to share. Yes, well, first I want to thank Wolf for bringing up this topic, which I find very interesting and also very important. And one thing I notice is, uh, uh, when, what I ask myself is, when does the musician notice that the bow weighs differently? Because uh, I brought a bow here today. It's a um, uh, luthier friend of mine lent it to me. It's a uh, Nicola Mea bow uh, for viola. And uh, I often have fun uh, uh, giving violists this bow to play if they are very fixed on what kind of weight they want the bow to be or what they want the bow to, to do. And then uh, because everybody loves this bow and nobody ever asks how much it weighs, but it weighs uh, 63.7 grams. Okay. So for a viola bow, this is uh, more than six grams less than what would be the norm. But uh, they, um, they never ask what it weighs and they never realize that it's such a light bow. And uh, everything with this bow is actually out of norm. So the, the head size is also, it's very small head and uh, it's very lightly cambered, but still it, uh, it works very well for the musician. So uh, my question is also to you, have you ever had the, the feeling that if the people know it's a, go by a respected maker that has been dead for a long time, that they are less likely to ask, what is the weight of the bow? But if it's a bow from a modern maker, it's more important that it's within the standards so that the musician would be feeling reassured buying this bow. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, I, I would say most probably that they have more respect for an old, historic bow maker, like these uh, famous bow makers, not to be okay in, in different ways. But uh, I would like to go back a little bit uh, uh, as, as I, when I started working with a violin making shop in, in, in Malmö many, many years ago, I had the experience, one customer came in with a, a kind of modern made bow and uh, he, he was up to evaluate this bow. And uh, he said, well, this maker, this, uh, this silver-mounted ebony frog, that would be uh, 2,000 uh, euros, for example, and I take, take in, in there now. And then, yeah, it's a good state and so, but it feels a little bit light. He put it on the, on the weight and it was 58 grams, I believe. Oh, that, that means that it will be harder to sell. So, so the evaluation will not be 2,000 euro anymore. It will be 1,600 euro. And I was so confused and I was thinking, is it really like that? Okay, I have had this in mind for a long time. Um, so, so, but anyway, um, a couple of years ago, there was, there was one customer asking me for, for, for a, a special light bow. And uh, I said, well, I have wood that is really hard and I cannot make any good bows weighing 60 grams from that. So I will try that out. It turned out to be about 57 grams and that was a lovely bow, super bow. So, so, so that also opened up again that, well, be more free with the wood you have and make the best out from every piece of wood. It was even next level of thinking that way. So, so that's also one reason why I take up this and, and Jun uh, 
I don't know if this answers your question, but, but uh, of course, I think uh, musicians are more open to old bows. But I mean, they start, I have the feeling that they start to, to open up here in Sweden anyway for, for, for also lighter, modern made bows. So, yeah. You know, I think there is a tension too between maybe a slight tension between the bow makers and the and the actual shops that are dealing them um, it sounds like the shop thinks it's harder to sell but um you know there's a good bow for every player you know um there you know there's a bow for every player so even though uh you know a shop thinks it needs to be in this range sometimes the dealers are not players um and they're not even craftspeople you know, they may not even be, uh, you know, makers of anything. So for them, they can only go by, oh, uh, well, this range. Um, so I think there is there is a little bit of tension there, even just with the shops. I know, you know, I left a shop that I worked at for 15 years. And now when I'm working with players individually, I feel like the range is a lot larger what players will accept as opposed to what shops will accept, you know. Uh, I, I made a bow one time for a shop, and they're like, the, the, the ferrule is, you're, you need to use a thinner material for the ferrule. I'm like, are you really complaining about that? Like, you know, <laughs> so not even just, not even weights and balances. They're telling me I needed to use a, a thinner, uh, you know, uh, flat, you know, and it was already thin. So I, I don't know where they get these ideas from. Anyone? Yeah, Josh. I, 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 um, I, I have experiences similar to yours, Tony, in in dealing with shops. I wanted to address something you you said a moment ago, Elf, um, about making a bow to the properties of the wood. Um, that's been my whole approach for the last twenty years, twenty years or so of of bow making, and and you know I tend said it a, f a few minutes ago about the other woods that are used. Some are heavier, some are lighter, but that's one of the trends I think in modern bow making. People say it has to be this thickness, or you have to follow the camber of oh Sartori or whoever, and it and and they make to numbers rather than the properties of the wood itself. And I think that's one of the things that, and again, coming back, it might be dealer driven because it's easy to sell something that looks like a Sartori or, or supposed to be playing like a Sartori or, or Picot or whatever, pick your model. Um, but dealers like those kind of things where you're copying something, but that's something that I, as I've, as I've made bows and I began to teach a little over a year ago, other makers, and the, the approach, the approach is, this is your piece of wood, make the best thing out of it that you can. And sometimes it is a little heavy, sometimes it's a little light, but it's a good plane though, is kind of the ultimate goal, um, rather than focus on a target number in weight or balance or thickness or stiffness. So um, I just wanted to comment, because you, you had mentioned that on the properties of the actual material. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I respond a little bit. Uh, anyone else would like to respond on this? I, I just uh, talk and talk. I. <laughs> anyone wants to respond? No. Nobody else has anything. Janelle. Janelle. I was going to say. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. Um, I just. Uh, well, I just wanted to add, like, I'm new, I'm pretty new to bow making, so I am trying to figure out all of these things, like the densities and, and the effects that that has on the weight and the balance point and everything uh, in the end, you know, trying to kind of associate those things. And I think that's really interesting. And actually, I'm making a bow for someone, or trying to make, make a bow for someone who is into playing a five string. Uh, violin right now and uh, I've talked to several makers about it and that was interesting to, to get their advice you know because uh, I lent her a viola bow <laughs> just to see how that felt to her and then also a, a violin bow and 
you know, of course she liked different things on the different bows. Like she liked the, the way the C string sounds on a viola bow, but she doesn't like the laborious uh, uh, weight of the bow. So I'm thinking of trying to make a stronger bow that maybe weighs just a little bit more, you know, uh, to kind of give her that um, C string, but then uh, still a violin bow that's in, in the acceptable range of a violin bow. So I haven't had the difficulties of trying to sell a dealer a, a heavier violin bow yet, you know, or what that would, what that would mean. Um, but I do know like in the instrument world, you know, people will take a ruler out and if your instrument is shorter or longer than 14 inches, they won't buy it, you know? So it's kind of, it sounds similar in the bow world where they're like really caring about weight where there's really like, seems like there's customers that are interested in a range, you know, they like trying different things and seeing what works versus, and, and what works with their instrument. Because I think, you know, if a, I, I wasn't used to thinking of instruments. I mean, I was, but like the brightness and darkness of an instrument and what you're trying to bring out with a bow, um, that was a new kind of idea for me, even though I do that all the time with instrument work. I don't do it with bow work yet <laughs> as much, you know? And I was like, oh, well, yeah, like trying to figure out if a certain weight and balance point will um, will work with with darker instruments versus lighter instruments, et cetera. So any thoughts that people have, I'm very open to hearing. I can uh, directly say I have made a five string uh, bows, for, bows for, for, for five string instruments, viola, violina or so. There's a quite many folk musicians in Sweden using this instrument and uh, to begin with, uh, I started, as you say, with, with a viola bow, but I, I tuned it down to, to find wood to, 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 uh, so I could make a bow that was about 66, 67 grams. And, and uh, we talk about weight now again. But anyway, if the bow was too, too heavy in a way, it seems to, to crash the E string. And if it was too light, it had no possibility to, to, to bring out the sound from the C string. So, so that's why I tried to make something in between, which we, not be easy to sell on the market within the shop. You are so right there. <laughs> so, but anyway, I I, uh, I, I make a brief uh, explanation what I think about when I make uh, bows. If I, if I have heavy wood that is a little bit more soft, I, I, I make one kind of camber. And if I do have a harder wood, I make a little bit different camber and try to use uh, my experience to to optimize as far as I can out from experience uh, what kind of camera and what kind of uh, tapering it would be. Um, so, does it uh, give you any any ideas? Uh, yeah, and I think that um, you know, I the several people that I've talked to have said, okay, well, you know, you um, like well, my old my old boss, Jerry, I talked to him about it a bit and he was like, well, they probably would want a violin feeling of a bow because they play, they play violin, um, but maybe to make the balance point further to the tips and further to the tip, which means that the weight is out at the tip a little bit more, right? And then, um, and then it's easier for them to cross over, but still get uh, dig into the, the lower strings. Um, and, and yeah, like, uh, picking, picking a, a Sartori or, um, a Lamy or something like in that, in that range where the timbre is closer to the head, um, I guess was kind of his advice on that. Um, sounds like you would, you would mostly go for the material of the, of the stick and then decide on the camber. Is that right? So just to respond there before we let Florian in is, is uh, I have used uh, quite heavy wood, actually density close to, to 120, 150, 120. And mm. if we talk about look, which I do, I do sometimes hate to talk about look because so many people just uh, 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 
have this as as the the foundation of what 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 is a good wood or no not but anyway the the look is can can be five three on this heavy wood which is really really strange combination but i i make a camber as you are into more like the, the one that is uh, more cambered into the tip in a way to, to keep the weight inside the stick in the middle of the stick and also have the power in the middle of the stick that has worked for me mm, okay. uh, thank you okay <laughs> Florian, did you have yes. okay um sorry for being late for um, uh, starting in in this conversation um i think uh these standards are very useful um, because they give a framework um, for most woods. So if you have a special piece of wood, you can deviate from the standard, but it helps the standards help you to decide uh, what way you can go to with that wood. If you have exceptionally heavy wood, um, it doesn't make it doesn't make sense to to make a very soft stick of it. Uh, just to keep just to keep the weight low so you should knowingly decide this wood needs to be on the on the stiffer uh, side so that you can can have a, a stick that supports the weight actually for the player because it doesn't make sense have a light stick with a heavy weight um, because that the, it will not work for most players so I think um, if if you have um, a wood that that deviates from the from the main road. Let's say if you have a number for looking for five thousand five hundred, and the density is um, um, one point one five, it would be useful for a for a cello bow. But you can't use the same wood for a for a violin bow because it it would be too too heavy for for the same for the stick for the stiffness that a violin player would like for the weight between 60 and 61 and a half. So I think if you if you use all the numbers, the density, the looky, um, the looky and a, a fitting camber to it, the standards help to decide um, what you can make of this stick. I, I hope maybe I, I'm not clear enough in this uh, in this idea, but um, I like the standards because they give a, a, a clear view what you can do with the with the with the uh, with the stick you have at hand. How do you feel about this? I, I feel uh, I feel somehow that when I have tried to make bows inside the frame of 60, 61.5, if if we keep there, I and I and I have helped been helped from from looking and, and density. Then I then I have a very small range of wood that I can work with, which also I've been thinking about quite a lot. That we 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 need I need I need to think about how can I use as many pieces as possible to make as many good bows as possible, and then I need to to widen this area of uh, uh, widen the frame of, of what is a good bow, and and as I. Told you this light bow, 57 grams that I made. That was made of looky, looky measuring 58, 5850 somewhere, and and had the density of uh, 110 somehow. And uh, anyway, I worked in this bow. I worked in the pattern of uh, Pacat in the 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 camber and quite big head. In this way, I could keep a good balance in the bow and and. I don't want to brag here, but but I, this this bow was uh, compared with with a, a couple of pacats and, and nice bows, and and mine was not the best sounding on plain bow, but it was certainly not the the, the uh, most no, not working bow. So so somehow I, I convinced myself here there is a possibility also to use this really hard and stiff wood for lighter bows. And, and give them a life that is uh, workable the way I think. I need to. I need to, to add this the work the, the the way I work. So mm -hmm. did it uh, give you a kind of balanced uh, balanced response? 
Yeah, I think I think I'm think I'm thinking about it in this in the song in the same lines because when you explain uh, you used a relatively heavy wood to make a, a very light bow, you also explained it 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 you just put it down in weight, but um, it seems to, you seem to to keep the strength in the middle of the stick, so so it's still stiff enough. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so I think the the idea behind um, you you're right. Everyone wants to use as much wood from his stock that he can. So um, if you have wood that falls out of the absolute mainstream, you can still make bows of it. But you have to very consciously decide what you can do with it. Um, and I think if if uh, I uh, if a maker decides I don't want to stick to standards. Um, he will probably make a lot of bows that will not work for anyone, because he just skips the standard. But he doesn't. He doesn't consciously make something useful with out of standards. That's that's what I was trying to express. So I think the standards they put you on edge of what what you can achieve with the wood. They shouldn't be used as a as as you can't use this wood because it will not reach the the thing that you want to be, to make. But you could, you could use the 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 knowing of the standards to make something that works, but is out of the standards. Yeah, yeah. I think Yoon was there also. Yoon, Yoon, you had been hanging around for a while. Can, can, I, can I? Yes. Well, the, we were talking about uh, we were talking a lot about the weight of the finished bow, which uh, what, what the standard would be like maybe fifty nine to sixty two. But uh, what has been bothering my mind for the last uh, year or so is that, is it really uh, interesting to talk about the finished uh, weight of the bow? Because uh, with you, if you have a, two bows with 60 grams, uh, with the lapping changing, the frog being, uh, being differently made, thicker, thinner silver on the button or on the frog, or maybe a tip plate with uh, silver. Is it, is it not more interesting to talk about the weight of the stick itself and the balance of the, the bow? Because uh, with a 60 gram bow, you can have, uh, a, for example, for a violin, you can have a stick that is uh, maybe 60, uh, 35 and a half grams with a lot of silver and a full button. It can also be a stick which is uh, 38 grams with a very light lapping. So it will have the same weight, but be very different working bows. So uh, for me, the question is, uh, is it not more interesting to talk about the finished weight of the stick and that maybe the balance of the bow? Because uh, uh, a bow that weighs 62 grams, but is uh, well balanced, would uh, feel like a well balanced 60 gram bow. You don't really feel the weight. You feel the difference in the weight uh, or where it is on the bow. Yeah, uh, very interesting uh, connection as well. You, you, uh, Josh, you had uh, had your hand up. Uh, do you want to respond to this? Do you want me to respond on you or? Um, yeah, thank, thank you. I, I was actually going to respond to something Florian said, but I, I want to address what John just said first. Um, I totally agree with what you just said about the stick weight and the 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 balance and the flexibility because you can alter all kinds of all kinds of other properties um, many of my personal bows i i put a capsule button so there's extra silver out on the end because the density of the wood is maybe not the greatest so th those are the exact those are the exact things that i do um, when I'm working a stick and kind of finishing the bow. Uh, but what I wanted to actually address a moment ago was something that Florian said um, about the standards. So I, I wanted to raise the question, uh, and I know there's a few of few people here, Itan and Ulf primarily, that use woods other than Pernambuco. But I wanted to raise the question about the use of alternate woods, whether they be ipe or ironwood or snakewood or or carbon fiber or whatever. Do do we see those standards that Florian was talking about? Do we see those standards changing? 
with wood that's not Pernambuco? Interesting. I have not uh, think about that. I, I I have not come across so many carbon fiber bowls. I see them now and then as as a uh, herring. So, but I, I I have made a couple of bowls out from iron wood, which is really really super nice wood. But it's yeah. so, so so I need to what I've done there to keep keep it inside kind of frame. I shortened the bow stick a little bit. I change the camera a little bit, and then I can make a violin bow up to maybe sixty. Okay. Because yeah, I was just kind of thinking about this as the discussion has evolved and this coming back to the question Janelle asked about making a bow for a five string. My first thought was use a more dense wood like snake wood. You get a little flexibility, you know, some, something like that to pull the tone out of the C string, but still give it a more of a violin playability if you can. So I, I don't know, is this, I was just kind of wondering as, I mean, I think most of us as modern bow makers, we still have the luxury of using Pernambuco. You know, maybe the next generation won't. And so will these standards of weight, balance, stiffness, all of these things, do we see them changing? Florian. Um, uh, I'm, as well as I'm as a bow maker, I'm also an orchestra musician, and in my orchestra, a few people are playing arcus bows. Um, mm -hmm. For for people that don't know them, they are carbon fiber bows. They're extremely light. They are very stiff. They have a very little camber, so they are very out of any range. Um, in my experience, those players are the ones that either have physical problems or some some way of playing that needs some sort of adapting and most of the times these are players that are always looking for something they're always on search of some magical things so uh, my opinion about this is as long as uh, music schools and and conservatories are educating people in the in the way of playing as the standard of violin playing is working now that long the standards of violin bows will will be probably probably the same as it is now but it doesn't the point it, it nothing is fixed so maybe in 100 years everything is different but just at the, at the moment i think the the violin technique as a whole changes very little over time it just develops but it takes it takes a long time till a whole school of violin playing has has emerged to something else so i think um, those standards of violin bows they will they will maybe gradually move, but not in in steps and not very radically. I'm, but I, I might be wrong. Maybe if Pernambuco is out of uh, out of the market, maybe some something has to change. So I, I'm I'm surprised. But I I see um, it's not that people willingly change uh, their technique to a, a very light or very he heavy bow there's always a reason behind this so either there is a physical problem or there is a mental problem because they always want to find something that works better than 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 it normally does um and another reason in 20 years might be that pernambuco is is not available anymore so maybe yes but not at the moment yeah yeah so i mean you know, it sounds like as far as what's acceptable is weights. I think people are more willing to accept a larger range of weights uh, and players. I think at least when, I, when I'm making a bow, I'm, t I'm targeting more so deflection and, and balance and so that it does play well. And I think, you know, weight can be adjusted by buttons and grips and, and lappings and things like t tip plates, like was mentioned earlier, of course. So the, it's more of a question, you know, is, is I think we have more leeway in, in weight, you know, um, as far as the standards of weights. I think people are more open to it as long as the bow, like you said, plays well. But is is the standards of deflection something that's more firm? Is the standard of balance more firm? It seems like weight, more people are open to variations of weight. The question is, is 
you know, the deflection um, has a big effect on how the bow feels, as well as does the camber, but um, it's kind of up for topic. Yeah. I have a... Comes, comes ideas to my mind and uh, as I've been exhibiting in, in different places, uh, in different groups, I, I, I have an, one experience from, from exhibiting both in, in Vienna, no, yeah, Vienna, yeah. And uh, it was what a quite successful exhibition for me. And then, then we moved our exhibition to, to, to Berlin and I was there three years and didn't sell anything. I, I didn't change my bows, what I can remember. and then, I was thinking then also do do we have different uh, schools and areas that, that want want different kinds of bows so some some uh, more more soft in the type and some more more stiff in the bow type uh, I don't know that's just one thinking I have June has something to say <laughs> yeah sorry for budging in on every every topic but uh, to address what Ulf just said I can uh, share my experience here. I've been having my own firm in France for three years and uh, I have sold uh, five bows in France in three years and uh, the rest have been sold in Germany or Switzerland, Denmark, Scandinavia or wherever else. But I have very, very few customers in France for my bows. And uh, just for the record, I make between uh, 20 and 40 bows a year. So it's really a very small portion of my bows that are sold in France. I don't know why they don't like them, but in Germany it works much better. <laughs> I think, yeah. Most of my bows, I, I, I do rehairs for a lot of people locally in the symphony locally. Nobody around here buys my bows. The, the expert's always the guy out of town. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's my experience too. <laughs> That's interesting, interesting, yeah. So, yeah, I have the experience to, to, to sell uh, both in the opera orchestra in Malmö, but not in the symphony orchestra. And that has also been going on for, for 10, 15 years. So, still, still the bows, in, in, when, I, when I show them in the symphony orchestra, they, they are good, but comes. And then there will be no selling. So, so um, anyway, yeah. I don't know really what, what comes, uh, is it uh, kind of um, talking good about the bows and they sell more, uh, could be something. Uh, I think maybe coming out from the topic now, <laughs> do I have something to, to reach, help us coming back or, or do, do we feel happy about this? No. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to come back actually to, to, to what June said about the balance. I think I think uh, uh, I think the balance is is uh, very very important and and uh, and that helps kind some some kind of that that's what I wh wh why I put put a little bit more full and heavy tip on 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 the bow with with the more slender stick and, and harder stick from the beginning to to to, to balance uh, how how this works that that was a good experience for me. Uh, because I, I don't think we can just hang on a, a silver tip on, on a bow to make it heavier then the stick will not bear it we will uh, work as well and, and uh, as well we can we can put the uh, 030 silver on on the 55 gram lamy for example just to make it uh, uh, coming up to 58 or close to 60 to, to, to make it inside the range and and the valuation will be better in, in, uh, for the insurance company, a little bit ironic there, of course. But but, but anyway, we can do a lot of things to, to, to weigh up a, a bow or, or take away a weight if we want to do that. But does it uh, give a better playing and sounding bow? That's uh, I'm not sure about that. My a, a few years ago, when the laws in the United States changed regarding. Um, Ivory, I mean, they changed in the 70s, but uh, I think it was six or seven years ago that um, things really kind of got, people got upset and things. I started 
using silver on all of my bows and instead of mammoth ivory. I had to learn how to make the upper portion of the stick again. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily about the weight, but the, I, I had been making bows with the same kind of way that I'd been making them with, with mammoth out there, but they just didn't play the same. There, there, was, a, there was more of a whippiness out there. So as a maker, I, I had to redefine what I was making when I started using silver tips. Um, and it's, you know, and they're, they're kind of going back to what I said a few minutes ago about sort of making the best playable bow out of the materials in front of you. Um, I, that, that was, that was something that, that really, you know, sometimes you feel a little like you're chasing that ideal, but it was that particular example of using silver on the tip really, I, I hate retrofitting silver to a bow that has ivory because it just, it just doesn't, to me, it doesn't always work that well. Mm -hmm. And, but there's a lot of, a lot of customers because of the laws and everything that want a metal tip out there for various reasons. But, um, yeah, the balance, balance is, uh, something to, to bear in mind and the, the, what, what it does to the playability of the stick. Yeah, yeah, I hopefully agree. Right, so that kind of was partially of what I, what I was saying is this, um, you know, there's more leeway in the weight, perhaps, but the balance points, is there much leeway in the balance point? That's, that's a question, you know, is that less, I mean, more or less, is that standard? Should we, should we be more aiming for a... Uh, a balance point and care less about weight, but making sure that uh, the, the balance is, you know, do we have like a few millimeters leeway? Do we have a few centimeters, like a centimeter or two leeway? You know, that's, you know, as we're talking about standards, I think it sounds like the consensus is there's more room for weight variation. My question is, is, is there more, is there room for balance variations? I think Florian, yeah, I think um, you can't ever use one standard alone uh, in a bow. You have you have to consider all standards together to make it work. And when John explained or he showed this bow, I, I couldn't see it in the picture, the, the mirror. Um, it is light, but my instinct would, or, or my suspicion would be, that there's also a balance more to the head. So for the, feel, for the player, it might be something that feels relatively normal, just the weight on the scale is not right, but in his hand, it might be, it might be feeling okay because it's more tip heavy. I don't know what sort of a lapping is on that bow, but I, I suspect a light lapping maybe. Maybe you could, you could explain, John. Um, so I think if you have a, a, the weight as a standard, you also have to relate it to the balance. And you, if, if you go steps further, you should also relate it to a certain camber and you should relate it to a distribution on the weight of the bow. And it doesn't make sense, in my opinion, to, to lift the weight up by putting a silver, silver button on it. Uh, and probably, Josh, you won't do that simply by itself. You will probably compensate it somewhere so, so I think um, all standards have to be in a in a way related to each other, and 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 it is I think education as a bow maker means um, to know all standards, but also know how they feel for a player and how they relate to each other. So I think when I use the word standard, I always have in mind a whole set of standards, not only one number. Yeah. That's well said, Florian. That's that's very well said. Thank you. So John, could you could you, could you maybe it would be interesting to talk a little bit more about that bow. I don't know how you feel, but it yes, might, yes, be, well, uh, might be clarifying for for us. Yes, well uh, it has a light lapping, it's a tinsel lapping and uh, it's uh, octagonal. So it uh, has a little bit more weight to the head, and the head is really a beefy one. 
So it has, uh, the, the balance is uh, normal. Uh, and also the deflection of the bow is normal, which is also... Would you say, uh, uh, could you, uh, could you uh, uh, what sort of a balance is, is um, when you say normal, we probably all have different uh, ways. Yeah, well, uh, it would be around 18 and a half from the frog, 18 and a half centimeters from the frog. Okay. Uh, well, maybe, I don't know what, uh, it's about what I see in the bows around here, what mm -hmm. uh, the viola bows here have. Okay. So, uh, so when you take it in the hand, it doesn't feel light. So it's uh, exactly yeah. what you were, were saying. It uh, that the weight might be off, but uh, the other other parameters feel normal. Okay. Actually, if you say eighteen and a half, that would be for my, for my bows. That would be even half a centimeter tip heavy. Um, so um, I would normally for my bone, I would be inclined to put a little bit heavier lapping on it if it fits my my aesthetic uh, idea so you might even end with 67 grams which is not exceptionally light for a viola bow it's it's okay so um yeah so it isn't in my opinion that bow you you would you would cite as an example that is out of standards maybe it's not that much out of standards yeah well that's also getting back to what I was uh, saying before about the weight of the stick. If the weight of the stick is not more important than the mm -hmm. actual weight of the bow. Because uh, as, uh, as you say, if you put on a different lapping on this one, it will, uh, it will be heavier, have a slightly different balance. And, uh, but you still have exactly the same weight in the stick. That, uh, can I ask a question to everyone in the group? Because when I make bows, I, I, the, the stick of the weight is, is pretty much determining for, determining for me. So I, I try to land a bow in a two, cent, a two gram range of the stick weight. Is that something that you guys do? No? Okay. I'm, I'm much more flexible. I, I make violin sticks out from, let's say, 35 up to 40 grams. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the 40 grams, uh, they are heavy, but, but, but also I, I try to, to make the sticks in a way, I often use very dense wood then, and, and I try to keep the weight more in the middle of the stick because two reasons. One reason is that I don't want the weight to be in the ends of the stick if it's heavy with this wood. And uh, also, if it's a little bit more flexible wood, I would like to keep uh, more strength in the middle. Yeah. Um, so I can make a light lapping and a lighter frog and then end up at 60, 61 grams anyway. Huh? If, I, if I make a kind of a stiffer wood, I, I, I make the, more, the stick more slender in the middle instead and make the head heavy and the, the, the frog heavy in a way. And then I can balance it that way also. So this is, Kind of roughly thinking there, so, so, so I'm more flexible in, in the, the weight of the finished mm -hmm. pre stick in a way. That's that's a similar approach to the way I've always uh, uh, approached bow making, um, and and I'll and I'll throw out the caveat that none of my wood has Luki numbers on it. I don't I don't know the density. I don't put it in water. I I just cut a piece of wood and I use it. Um, so, you know, I, there, there are philosophies of bow making that are more, um, data oriented and I'm not one of those. So, but my, my approach is, and, and I, I played violin, um, not professionally or anything, but I, I played it uh, as a youth and all through college and everything. So I do know a good bow when I play one. Uh, and so as a maker, I, I, I make the stick and, and as I'm cambering and flexing and everything, I, I know what the target weight I want, but if it varies a little bit, once I get the feeling of the stick, it might be a little lighter or a little heavier than the target weight. But I, I, I stop making the stick just before I like the way it feels. Um, and then in the final final tapering final polishing you know i'll i'll i'll, di I'll dial it in um and and also i usually put the hair in the bow and i put a 
a lead tape around where the grip is and I'll, and I'll actually play the bow. I'll feel it. And, and then I'll shave a little more off or I'll, I'll do a little cambering or, you know, in, in places. And so my, my approach is more, um, what I feel rather than putting it on a scale. I, I admire you, Josh, because I've been, working. I need to say in this group, you don't, you don't tell anyone else. No. <laughs> okay. I, I, I have sometimes fear when I work with a stick. This is, this is, this stick, it can be really something wonderful. But then I also have on the other side, oh, it has to be in the kind of standard. And then I have the feeling that I have ruined some sticks that I've been playing too much. And it has been on the soft side in my standards. And I have also so made sticks that has had, I, I had to keep weight in it. And then I've left it too rigid in a way. So, so even if I play, I just play, play Swedish folk music. Uh, music uh, uh, and that, that helps me the way I can feel the bow, and I do as exactly as you do. I, I put hair in the bow and just try. It takes time. It's just kind of kind of uh, fun time for me to to play it because I like it uh, to, to try it out. Anyway, uh, I think uh, I admire you, Josh. Coming back to that, to to, to be more free in, in what this stick can be for uh, as a good bow and the way it is secondary. Oh, thank thank you. I appreciate you saying that, and that's. No, but by by doing it that way in the final finishing steps, then I can determine the type, the length, or the weight of the grip, and the things like that. That all kind of the finishing details. But the the one other thing I was going to add that kind of throw into this idea that we've been talking about is specifically when I make viola bows, um. A violin and cello, there's a pretty well-defined full size. Mm -hmm. Viola bows, um, for, for more than 10 years, I was doing every two years here in the United States was a viola congress. And I would go and do rehairs and I would go make bows and I'd sell. But it gave me a really good, uh, you know, the watching people with larger, larger violas, their arms are out here and smaller viola. So viola bows are the one area where I'm a much more free on not just weight but balance as well. Um, if I'm if I'm making a bow for somebody playing a 17 inch um, uh, viola, then then the balance point will be a centimeter further out towards the head. Mm -hmm. um, you know, general coincidence of that. You know, there's always exceptions, but um, but. Does anybody else have that kind of thought when you're making a viola bow? I see Florian's got his hand up. Yeah, I mean, I think your your, your experience uh, relates to to viola makers because uh, violas are large mess, much much less uh, standardized than violins and, and cellos. So probably it, that might be the reason why viola players are also more flexible. <laughs> for both so I think that's not not very unusual or, or it, it relates to my experience as well okay. yeah. there's even one really well-known viola player Thomas Kakuska from Vienna who played for the I think for the Alban Berg Quartet in the in the 80s 90s and he used to play half of, of his career on a cello bow so um, yeah, so I think that that gives the variety of of violin of, of viola playing. Uh, it, it may be less less of a standard in in the whole viola world than than in the rest of the music world. Right. You know, on a more like theoretical or uh, top, uh, maybe a little bit off topic, but um, I think the reputation of the bow maker has a lot to do with that. You know, for example, you know, uh, John is a, is a younger maker, you know, only th three years in his career, you know, sh shops are going to want to see a, a certain standard from him. But Ulf, for example, you, you could probably get away with a lot more and mm -hmm. could get away with even more, you know. And if we look back, like, for example, Sartori, you know, he was copying his teachers or copying what was fashionable at the time. 
And then perhaps after he developed a name for himself, that's when he started to really develop his own model and his own idea of, of uh, you know, taking that camber and the weight and, and the balance. And people accepted that. So I wonder, um, you know, for young makers, I, I can see where a lot of us are trying to aim for these standards to appease a, a larger majority of players and shops. But as, as you develop a reputation, you know, you're able to experiment more and people will be okay with it. You know, as, as a young maker, we, you know, we're worried about selling X number of bows to feed our family. Um, where if you already have, it's a- not just young, it happens <laughs> all of us. All of us are looking to sell X number of bows to feed our family. So, I mean, this isn't necessarily about specific standards, but the leeway that established makers have. Uh, I I respond here because it's something I've been thinking about a lot. Uh, You you have different brands of cars with different reputation, and and then you have also uh, body makers, bow makers build up reputation, and, and... Yes, it, 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 it's somehow easier when you have established yourself and, and uh, to, to, to make the customer feel more safe to, to buy something because uh, not all uh, buyers are, are that critic that, that they, they put, uh, put uh, is it blindfold or what is this? Something on the, on the eyes and then try blindly. Um, that is that is one part of it. Uh, uh, re- recommendation from teacher, other musicians, and everything helps. Um, I was up to say something here. Mm, yeah, it disappeared. Fifty-six years old. <laughs> you, you know, Tony. To address what you were asking about reputation, um, I think. To a certain extent, I think we can see that. Take, for instance, the maker Benoit Roland. When he was young maker in, in France and developed the, the carbon fiber bow, um, it was not accepted over there. Um, and then only, you know, it, it took years of pushing and building that, and it, and it you know, times change, it, it became accepted. Uh, a few years back, Benoit Roland made this angled frog. He calls it the Galine frog. Some dealers like that, some don't. And so I, th- I think with, with a great reputation, you can push things like that a little bit. Maybe Viome did that with, with a steel bow and with the, with, the, with the rounded mounting on the Viome frog, things like that. But I think if you push things too far, I, then th- then they don't catch on. I I uh, I have not seen the Galine frog from from Benoit Roland catch on in with with too many players or dealers. Um, but does Benoit have a problem selling his bows? Not at all. <laughs> um, so I, it's it's an interesting interesting idea of what you what you what you're saying is, and and relating it back to us as you know, different points in our career where, you know, a a few grams difference to a dealer means they wouldn't buy it, but to a player, they'll just pick it up and, oh, I love this. And then, you know, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I, I I can come back now because now my memory (laughs) blinked again. (laughs) So anyway, coming back to to, to this, um, uh, if we call it the famous or so, um, when when I when I sell bows, I also somehow try to, to to sell it directly to customers as much as possible. Okay, it gives me more money, and and also the other uh, possibility is to, to 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 give the buyer a kind of nice experience when they, they buy a bow. We have a, we have a conversation about. Uh, how how to make the bow and then I send pictures do along the the making of the bow, and then then when I come they they already halfway know the bow in a way that that that's one way to build up and and having nice experience and and that is uh, is one way to to to, to, um, to add something to the customer in selling a bow for me. 
Um, and uh, I will uh, connect something else here also. We, we talked about uh, when, when you are known on the market and, and people feel about more safe in a way which they should not be, of course, but, but they do feel more safe. I also, we talk about this, Rebecca and I, uh, try to introduce a little bit different things. Uh, I have been using, for example, the reindeer antler for, as, as a tip plate material since five years back and, and it was kind of scary in the beginning but, but along the road it, it shows up to be uh, at least as good as, as a good mammoth ivory not as hard as, as, as uh, elephant ivory but I sometimes I also feel that elephant ivory when it's hard is too hard in a way it's definitely better than bone bone is so brittle so that, that's one of the things that I try to do when I, when I uh, am more kind of reliable bow maker for, 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 for customers. Uh, we also talk about ebony, for example. Now we come aside the, the, the lane again, but we talk about ebony. Why, why, don't, why can't we use the kind of ebony that is really nice, but also have brown stripes in it? Guitar makers seems to be more open to, 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 to use material that is not uh, uh, that is beautiful and also gives gives a nice look to, to, to the instrument. So by that reason, I, I I'm I'm uh, happy if I could find a nice piece of ebony that is also a little bit brown inside. So that's a way to to, to use the kind of reliability as a, a kind kind of established bow maker. Does it add anything to you <laughs> when I say that? I I make frogs out of snake wood, okay, and yeah. I start I start uh, snake wood is my favorite my favorite wood, and um, I started doing I had some highly flamed pernambuco that was yellow in color, and it was light, uh, slightly less dense and and so I was making viola and cello bows out of this flamed yellow Pernambuco with a brown snakewood frog. And it caught on. And uh, again, that's one of those things that at first people, you know, come back to the question of standards. And it's like, well, you know, it's not ebony. It's different. And I bought, I, I, I use it for aesthetic reasons, but also it's, you know, it's nice and dense. But I, I, I'm with you, Ulf. I, I love the beauty of flawed ebony um if i if i can say say it that way where there's streaks or things one one of the most beautiful frogs in my opinion that i've ever made had this giant brown stripe right through the middle of it it was absolutely beautiful and i made a cello bow out of uh with that and and the head on the bow had a big mineral streak right through the middle of it so it kind of matched the flaw on the frog um, not everybody's open to that uh dealers especially <laughs> but customers players they like the story behind that and you know if it plays and if it meets their expectations in other ways then then i think most players don't mind the use of things like that i agree I've, I've, I've joked for years with people around me. It's like, I, I don't want to read what they write about me in books in the future. Cause my making is, you know, not consistent. <laughs> anyway. I think Alessandra, did you have something you wanted to, to share? You're, you're muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. About, about what, <laughs> Ulf was saying about um, Stripe Ebony, about guitars maker. I recently read an article about Taylor's guitars uh, that they started using not really black ebony for fingerboards on their guitars because they realized that they didn't know before that in Africa they were cutting woods for them and they were leaving the ones that were not completely black on the ground so so once i think it was the the tailor owner we realized that he said no from the from now on 
would start using again this word because it's old ebony. So uh, and so they started using this now on on the guitars. So why don't we do that too? I think somehow that uh, we need to, to to take care about what what nature give us and and and. Uh, Honor, honor the wood by doing the best we can from it and, and uh, if it's a little bit yeah. and, and uh, so it, it's not to the historical standard but it it it's, it it shows that that we actually take more care about what's coming out and then just uh, what what the eyes want to see in historical view yeah what do you think okay. we we should do an exhibition with uh, bows made from alternative woods for the stick and for the frog. <laughs> I like that. I like that idea because I think also it depends on the communities you live in and what people start seeing. I think a lot of people don't even know that there are other options of wood or other aesthetics that uh, I think a lot of people are very open to that. But, you know, I think the problem is shops or dealers that are that are very focused on very specific things because you know I've worked in different industries and I once worked in a furniture store and you know you can paint an orange you can paint a dresser orange but um, there aren't going to be as many people that are going to buy an orange dresser as there are going to be people that buy a black or white one you know so you paint like 50 of them black and white and then you paint three of them orange blue and red and then you know that's kind of it seems like the market's kind of like that in the bow world too and i think that yeah the more people start seeing color or that more that it's in fashion um the more the more open-minded they'll be about that but i also wanted to kind of go back to that um the topic of uh balance points. <laughs> Sorry, I'm kind of like going back a couple chapters, but I was curious what people's balance points are, you know, like um, at, at Jerry's shop, we had a, a set number, you know, and I, I guess I could share that with people if they're interested um, of like what range and for whatever reason, he measured it in inches, but I can <laughs> translate that. Um, it's like the only part we ever measured in inches, uh, which is kind of a pain. But uh, like for violin, for violin bows, the range was um, a quarter inch, and it was uh, seven and a quarter inch to seven and a half inch, and that was measured with the frog, like the frog was loosened all the way, and then. And then uh, the balance point was taken and measured to the thumb projection of the frog, right? So, so it was seven and a quarter to seven and a half for violin, seven and a quarter to seven and a half for viola, and then for cello it was six and seven eighths to seven and one eighth inch for cello. And I was just curious, you know, like what other people um, had for numbers. I, I could add uh, somehow the numbers I have. I, I, I do during the years I have been uh, making some some uh, yeah <laughs> some measurements on the bows I've made since '95 about, uh, and and I do can can send you. A little bit of information what I have if someone else would be interested I could could, could add you in that kind of group that is uh, uh, could be I could yeah. give what I have so uh, this is um, coming to, to close to finish our our nice meeting here and uh, and uh, if uh, I don't know if we have been talking about about the subject 60 to 62 grams and and the uh, uh, Develop this into other areas, uh, which has been really interesting and nice. And and uh, I I feel that it was uh, it has been really nice to 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 talk to you and listen to you and and uh, and 
uh, tried my best to, to answer out from my experience and, and uh, taken in from your experience. So I, I'm really super happy that I could uh, be invited by Anthony to, 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 to be kind of, uh, uh, what shall I say, ha keeping, uh, keeping this uh, meeting. <laughs> so thank you everyone.